All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the virtual day of the NC Live Annual Conference. We are excited to have you join us online. You are in the session. Um, so, sorry, let me pull up my notes here. The Ethical Tightrope, Balancing Library Values and the Parents' Bill of Rights, Patron Privacy Challenges. And this is a session scheduled for 10 a.m. My name is Claire Leverett and I am the Associate Director of NC Live. As the moderator for this session, I just wanna share a few things before we begin. So at NC Live events, we value the presence and active participation of all attendees. So by joining us, you agree to uphold the principles of our code of conduct, which can be found on our website. And I'm just going to um, put the link in our chat right here. So in the interest of time, we're going to save question and answer for the end of the presentation. Um, and if you have a question, you may put it in the, um, the chat box, which can be found in your Zoom toolbar. Um, and I'll be monitoring the, the chat in case anyone needs assistance. Um, but also please make sure that you stay muted during the presentation. And the session is being recorded and it will all the recordings will be available on our YouTube channel um, after the conference is over. And our this presenter's slides will also be posted after the conference if you would like to access them later. So now I am pleased to introduce Allison Sills from Central Carolina Community College. Um, Allison is formerly the cataloging and tech services librarian at Lee County Public Library. Uh, she created Lee County Public Library's PopCon and adult programming, including that library's first band books club as the instruction librarian, instructional librarian for Central Carolina Community College, she teaches students library research skills and recently presented on identifying chat GPT in collection development at NCLA 2023. All right, and I will now hand it off to Allison. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start presenting my slides and I'll turn my video off and give me just a second. everybody see that? I'm going to go with yes. And um, hello, my name is Allison Sills. I work at Central Carolina Community College as an instructional librarian. As librarians, we cultivate a lot of information and inhabit a lot of societal trust for doing so. I feel it is our duty to be the best stewards of that information as we can be. So today let's talk about the ethical tightrope we walk between balancing library values today against specifically the North Carolina um, New Parents Bill of Rights and the patron privacy challenges that it engenders. So when it comes to patron privacy, we each know our own struggles, whether you work in a K-12, a public, or a university or a community college library. Community college libraries especially are experiencing a unique crisis because we often host high school aged minors in early colleges as, as well as adult students. I've done some research locally and I know that some people have always had library patron circulation history tracking on and some have always had it off. And some of us who always had it off had it turned on with or without our input. So um, the FERPA, the Federal, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act was passed in the 70s and that law allowed parents the right to view their child's educational records, which can include library records and it predated computers. But then the digital age happened and records keeping became not only easier, but it allowed for a vast, almost limitless amount of storage of data, storage that as it was migrated online became less and less secure. As hackers and even our own government became interested in that data, passing laws such as the Patriot Act, our professional organization had to come up with new ways to protect our patrons. The American Library Association recommended data minimization in 2002, and then the Parents' Bill of Rights passed in 2023. And its vague language has people scrambling again, but should it? So today let's talk about, we'll talk about the history of privacy in libraries, what does our professional organization say about privacy today? And what exactly does the law say? 
So has anybody seen the movie, the 1995 movie Seven with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman? It's a horror film and it's graphic, so it's not for the faint of heart, but you can always watch this clip on YouTube, which is in my references as well. There's a scene in the middle of the film where Morgan Freeman uses his contact at the FBI to get circulation records for certain books, and you can see the closed captioning here on the screen cap. And spoiler alert, this is how they catch the killer. And when I first saw this movie, I cried foul because I really didn't think this scenario was possible. Not only was it gross government overreach, but even Brad Pitt's character says, how is this legal? I was convinced that it was a fictional plot device that was made up for the movie to move the story along, but it could never happen. No library would allow it, but I was wrong. Not only did it happen, it had a name and went on for decades before it was revealed. And it continues to happen to this day. So let's talk a little bit about the history of privacy in libraries and the government. And I'm going to spend some time here because I want you to get a real feel for what our purpose was, what it has become, and what are the real threats that we are facing. So let's go all the way back to 1906. In this case, uh, I found a government surveilling a library, but it wasn't our government that was doing the surveilling. It was the Russians, because at the time, Russia was a monarchy and an ally. And in this article in the, the New York Times, the Russian Secret Service surveilled, and I quote, all libraries in the city of New York. They were looking for readers of books on anarchy and just about any books in German. In 1906, there were international agreements on information sharing for the policing of anarchists due to the assassinations of world leaders such as Tsar Alexander II in 1881 and President William McKinley in 1901 by anarchists. In 1918, we are at war and the U.S. passes the Sedition Act, making it illegal to speak, write, print, or publish anything critical of the U.S. government. And even though this was repealed in 1920, this is really the start of a time where librarians are used not only to censor materials the government doesn't like, but also to target readers of those books. And it is not a small segment of the population. First, it was books on anarchy and German language books. And then after the Russian monarchy falls to the Bolsheviks, it becomes Russian language books and books on communism and Marxism. And as Jim Crow laws are adopted, this quickly leads to bans on books promoting not just African-American stories, but just liberal or left-leaning causes. And librarians don't like this misuse of their profession. In 1939, after 20 years of discussions, librarianship officially adopted the concepts not only of equality, but also confidentiality as ethical obligations, similar to other professions like law and medicine. And as World War II begins in 1939, and in response to increasing propaganda and increasing censorship, the ALA creates the Library Bill of Rights and the Code of Ethics to make our positions official. In 1947, the war has ended, the Soviet center Red Scare begins, our wartime alliance with the Soviet Union collapses into an ideological and political rivalry, all those Russian employees that were previous allies are quickly spies, President Truman orders loyalty checks for all of our federal employees, and the newly formed House Un-American Activities Committee accuses even the Library of Congress of harboring aliens and foreign-minded Americans. This begins a very charged period of suspicion, innuendo, accusation, and retribution now known as McCarthyism, named after Senator John McCarthy, who was a virulent anti-communist. Librarians are caught up in this controversy. They had both their funding and their employment threatened after any pushback. Pro-Soviet books are purged and soon other materials viewed as anti-American follow, like even horror comics. Librarians, Often federal employees had to sign loyalty oaths. Those who didn't sign faced scorn and often lost their jobs. When half the staff of the LA County system, library system left rather than sign such oaths, staff member Julia Leonard Steiner takes her case to the Supreme Court. She is upset that her neighbors are being asked about her reading habits. And that case becomes part of the first loyalty oath challenge decided by the Supreme Court which she lost incidentally, and loyalty oaths do continue. But in response to that, the ALA revises the Bill of Rights and publishes a resolution on loyalty pro programs that says librarians are both free from persecution by surveillance and should also provide those same protections to their patrons. 1970, peacetime brings exactly that and much controversy around libraries, privacy and censorship died down until we entered the Vietnam War. 
In 1970, the government again started surveilling libraries to find bomb-making radicals and dissidents called the IRS inquiries. It was actually the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms unit that, how that was also housed under the Treasury Department that made the inquiries at three different libraries across the nation. Those inquiries made news. <clears throat> and uh, North Carolina Senator Sam Irwin Chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights requested an explanation from the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary responded with some details, but finally said that their policy was going to continue and they're going to request any uh, access to specific library records in justifiable situations. In response to that, to this intrusion, the ALA <clears throat> publishes a new policy on the confidentiality of records, reiterating that we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality, except when presented with lawful subpoena, which these inquiries did not possess. And then unbeknownst to almost everyone, except the few librarians involved, the FBI begins um, surveillance of libraries in a new program called the Library Awareness Program. And there is an entire book written about this, if you're interested, called Surveillance in the Stacks. It's a fascinating book if you want to know how the situation was addressed 15 years before the Patriot Act. It's remarkably similar. There really does seem to be a 15 to 20 year cycle on privacy concerns. And I think it's probably the phenomenon about the length of the human memory. History just keeps repeating itself. By 1975, the rumors of these um, the FBI talking to libraries is starting to circulate and libraries again are being targeted by the FBI. The ALA publishes a statement on professional ethics reaffirming again that librarian must protect the essential confidential re uh, relationship that exists between the library user and the library. Eventually Congress schedules hearings on this FBI library awareness program. It's made news, people are talking about it. You can watch these proceedings on C-SPAN. You can email me uh, for the link if you are interested. It's fascinating testimony. It's the Cold War and the FBI was concerned that foreign nationals were piecing together non-classified, commercially available information, somehow gaining intelligence that way. This was never proven to be true throughout all of the FBI's diligence. The author of the book, again, Surveillance in the Stacks um, by Herbert Fowerstell, He's one of the people testifying. Um, and while the FBI announced at those hearings that the program ended in 1987, the FOA or Freedom of Information Act requests eventually that they eventually got revealed that they did not stop investigating, even though um, even through 1989, the FOA also revealed that they had conducted over 100 background searches on librarians or their associates who had criticized the program. Even after the hearings, at no time was any order delivered by Congress to the FBI to cease or desist. So everyone was talking about how bad it was, but nobody did anything. Nobody stopped it. In 2001, this is probably where most of us come into the, the history, 9-11 happens and the Patriot Act is passed. In the Act, Section 215 greatly expands the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, allowing for the seizure of any tangible thing under reasonable grounds, not requiring a warrant. And if you are approached, you are not allowed to discuss that interaction. There was a gag order attached. The FBI is granted the ability to search three levels down in data. That means Kevin Bacon degrees of separation. If you know someone who knows someone who might know a foreign contact, then you can be thoroughly investigated and secretly. And within just a year, the San Francisco Chronicle is already reporting that libraries are being contacted. The University of Illinois sends out questionnaires to a thousand libraries. 85 report that they have been asked by federal and local law enforcement for information about patrons. That same year, the ALA amends its advice to the nation's libraries and recommends avoiding creating unnecessary records, AKA to start adopting data minimization. Ann Turner, president of the California's Library Association says, they can't find what we don't have. In 2005, four librarians with the backing of the ACLU appealed to the US Circuit Court of Appeals to have gag orders removed from themselves so they can talk about their experiences confronting the FBI. 
The freedom was granted, and again, the cat was out of the bag that the government was spying on our citizens. In 2013, what we wouldn't know until a decade later was just how deep the surveillance had become. In 2013, Edward Snowden whistleblows that the NSA is tracking everybody's email, texts, and phone numbers globally. It's unprecedented. I strongly recommend that you know you please watch Citizen Four, the Academy Award-winning documentary about Snowden, or um, watch a movie, read a book, anything about him. If I can't convince you that the government really is interested in the records that we keep, maybe this material can. In 2019. The ALA finally adds Article 7 to the Bill of Rights. We'll go over that in text in just a moment. A year later, in 2020, the U.S. Foreign, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court revealed that the FBI misused its controversial surveillance powers more than 278,000 times to conduct warrantless searches on protesters on both sides of the political spectrum, including Black Lives Matter, Matter protesters and the January 6th protesters. Most of these people are American citizens. So now we're, it's 2024, and uh, this is what we're facing now. The pay, uh, power once given is seldom returned. The Patriot Act was supposed to sundown in four years, but it was renewed again and again and again and again last December and again last month for two more years. And it is because we may never get that power back that we librarians must think about how it's best to protect our patrons. Now that we have a new law to interpret and deal with, it's called the Parents' Bill of Rights. What are we going to do? So what does our profession have to say about privacy? Privacy is a key component of our very core values. The ALA devotes no less than nine heavily referenced pages to the subject. So what do they say? The Library Bill of Rights has seven articles. Number seven says all people, regardless of age, origin, background, or views, possess a right to privacy and confidentiality in their library use. Libraries should advocate for, educate about, and protect people's privacy, safeguarding all use data, including personally identifiable information. Our code of ethics, third of nine codes, says we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. Our freedom to read statement, it covers a lot of bases and I highly recommend a reread if it's been a while. My favorite lines say, Suppression is never more dangerous than in a time of social tension. Freedom has given the United States the elasticity to endure strain. Every silencing of heresy, every enforcement of an orthodoxy diminishes the toughness and resilience of our society and leaves it less able to deal with controversy and difference. We need a tough and resilient society to face the problems ahead. So what does ALA recommend for our vendors? They too have to adhere to our values and federal laws, including FERPA and COPA. Again, data minimization is mentioned as is that users should have the choice to opt in to any data collection that occurs. That means if you change your procedures, say turn on patron history tracking suddenly, then you are duty bound ethically to inform your patrons so that they can decide to voluntarily opt out if they desire. You can see here some of the other vendor requirements. We should be at the very least as attentive to our patrons as we require our vendors to be. So what exactly does the law say? North Carolina law has a, li a library privacy law on the books. NC General Statute Chapter 125 Article 3 states, a library shall not disclose any library record that identifies a person as having requested or obtained specific materials, information, or services or as otherwise having used the library, except upon written consent of the user or pursuant to a subpoena, court order, or otherwise required by law. It's very important that you train all of your workers about the, specific of the specifics of the law because this is what adults are going to reference if you give out any of their information without cause that leads to repercussions. And if anybody here has worked in a public library for any length of time, I'm sure you've had at least one story to tell of the cops coming in and asking for information. I have several. Staff training is as important as is important as our desk staff often deal with these requests from both law and now parents. And you may not be there when they do. It could happen during lightly staffed evening hours. 
So finally, we are at this new law, the Parents' Bill of Rights. What exactly does it say? Under a section called Public School Unit Requirements, it says that parents have the right to review all available records of, uh, of material their child has borrowed from the school library. Let's break that down a little deeper. What is a public school unit? Obviously, public schools fall into this category, but what about community colleges? The bill has a few definitions and defines the state as the state, any of its political subdivisions, or public school units. And the use of the word or implies that political subdivisions and public school units are different entities. So far as community colleges are concerned, they do more align with the definition of a political subdivision than a public school unit. Also, the NC General Statute 115D on community colleges states that the major purpose shall be the offering of vocational and technical education and training for students who are high school graduates or beyond the age limit of the public school system. So community college and thus its library, uh, doc the library's documented pr primary purpose is to serve adult students seeking vocational accreditation. So let's look at, let's look next at all available. Prior to the Parents' Bill of Rights, FERPA law already existed and FERPA is a federal law that already gave parents the right to review their child's educational records. So what were you doing prior to the Parents' Bill of Rights? This is where I found processes differ. I found high school librarians who had always had history turned on and some who always had it turned off. Community colleges in North Carolina, to my knowledge, had tracking turned off and we were in compliance then. So if the language of this new law is similar to the old law, why should we behave any differently? All available is not defined by the new law, so we can assume it means all available according to our professional ethics. And our professional ethics recognizes that children have the same rights to privacy as adults. And libraries should collect the minimum amount of personal information required to provide service. That is from ALA's guidance for K through 12 schools. We comply by providing current patron circulation history to a parent or by subpoena by law. And a parent can ask every week if they choose, but we do not keep historical records to protect our patrons' privacy. This new law further did not insist that we require, it didn't require a change to the way we did things, and it didn't uh, insist that we start doing something we didn't do before. So what does federal law say? And I hate to be that guy that constantly comes back to the Constitution, but I'm going, I guess I'm going to be Federal laws and the U.S. Constitution also address the right to privacy if indirectly and through subsequent court cases. The First Amendment implicitly safeguards the right to privacy in the form of freedom of thought and intellect, as articulated by Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in his famous dissent in Olmsted v. United States. The makers of our Constitution undertook to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness. They sought to protect Americans and their beliefs their thoughts, their emotions, and their sensations. They conferred, as against the government, the right to be let alone, the most comprehensive of rights, and the right most valued by civilized men. This is right from the ALA's website, that quote. And in Griswold v. Connecticut, Justice William O. Douglas placed a right to privacy in a penumbra of um, constitutional amendments, including the first, third, fourth, fifth and ninth. So even though there is no constitutional amendment specific to privacy, its importance is implicit in several amendments. So again, if there are any doubts about our responsibilities on the subject, please refer to ALA's pages on privacy, especially if you need talking points to address people with concerns. So what about future laws? I've heard people argue, uh, don't we need to do this now because future laws are coming in a discussion about this new law that I've been in part of. I've heard people who expressed fear about what the legislation might do in future laws. First, if we are afraid, our patrons are afraid, the fear cycle really does need to end with us. We stop the fear cycle for our patrons. And second, no one will protect us later if we don't stand up for our ourselves now. As for other laws, they have tried to introduce a more stringent bill, as far as libraries are concerned, in July of 2023 called the Children's Omnibus Bill, Senate Bill 90. It added restrictions onto public libraries, 
who would have had to move materials into age-restricted rooms and parents would have to give consent for minors to check out certain books. But parents already do have that privilege because a parent is financially responsible for the child's account in a public library. So children can't enter into contracts. So if a child loses a book, the parent will be paying for it. So parents already had access to what their child had currently checked out. And also, but as with this bill, the NC legislature couldn't get the votes to pass this bill. House Representative Speaker Tim Moore said, I don't know that the votes were there for it. There was some pushback within the caucus about some provisions concerning libraries or books. So we do have support in the legislature on all sides, even in states where libraries don't have the support. In Arkansas, and no shade because I grew up there, don't hold it against me. Um, no shade. A similar bill to this omnibus bill was passed in Arkansas that added public libraries and bookstores to the list of restrictions. But 18 plaintiffs have sued that state and a federal judge has enjoined parts of the law that he felt were unconstitutional against librarians. That federal lawsuit goes to court in October of this year. So we'll see how the federal law lands on this topic very soon. What is the worst thing that could happen if you choose not to turn on patron checkout history? State Board of Education Attorney Allison Schaefer said in a WRAL interview that parents can complain to the school board and the school board can agree there was a violation, but they can't do anything. The state board cannot order a district to do anything specific. It's all up to your institution and I hope that you are all supported there. The consequences of breach in privacy are bad, and they're not always perpetrated by lawful actors like the FBI. Many breaches are unlawful. No less than 10 counties have been cyber attacked in the last five years. Bladen, Chatham, Edgecombe, Green, Halifax, Jones, Nash, Orange, Pamlico, and Scotland counties, as well as Durham's NC Central and even North Carolina-based book vendor Baker and Taylor have all experienced cyber attacks since 2019. Why should we voluntarily proffer up extra information? Doing that erodes patron trust in our library. It compromises the library's reputation. It has a chilling effect on library uses and leads patrons to self-center. And that narrows an individual's right to freedom of speech, First Amendment and freedom of expression. It breaks our Bill of Rights. It breaks our Code of Ethics. It breaks the law, both state and federal. Can we even call ourselves a safe space anymore if we are quietly harvesting circulation information on our patrons? Protecting patron checkout history is one of the seven most important rights libraries promise our patrons. In the Library Bill of Rights, when we honor that agreement, we preserve trust in our institution, we encourage reading and learning, we protect our patrons from discrimination, we follow the majority of laws up to and including the federal level, and we support all cultures and promote intellectual diversity. I feel it is our duty to protect our patrons' privacy as zealously as we are able. We stop the fear cycle. Even with laws like the Parents' Bill of Rights, we have choices. If you would like to know what my institution did, please email me and I will be glad to talk to you about it. I implore you to stand up for your patron's privacy and resist any pressure to keep patron history tracking on by default. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Allison. That was a wonderful overview of everything and, and very inspiring. Um, we do have one question in the chat um, okay. while some others come in. So. Norma says, I am in circulation at a state university. We do not discuss a patron record with anyone but the patron. Parents often call regarding bills, and we always say that they cannot talk to them about the student's account. Is this process affected by the new law? Is there an issue if the student is under 18? Okay. Um, do we always say that we cannot talk to them? Okay. This is all, it's kind of about perspective. Um, I don't know how someone would turn off historical records that had them turned on already. Um, 
is this process affected by the new law? The process, the new law is deliberate. I don't know if it's deliberately vague. I won't say that. It is written vaguely and it does mimic a lot of the FERPA language. So I believe because it is vague that the professional, that the profession of the librarians are best at interpreting how to, how best to protect our patrons and um, obey the law. And I feel that the current checkout records are enough to fulfill the term all available. So I, I don't think that there's much of a change because the new law does mimic the FERPA language and the FERPA language says that parents have right to access their children's records. So if you if you were keeping them before, then that is what you were always doing. If you weren't keeping them before, I think that current probably is fulfills the need for the new law. I don't feel that the new law does state much different than the FERPA law, which has been in place for 50 years. And if the student is below 18, if you're in a community college, you said you're in a state university, they still haven't defined what is a public record and what is a student record. At, at worst, these could be, these records could be, um, could be open to FOIA requests if it is considered a public record, which some student records are. If it's just a student record, it's still available to the police by subpoena. And that is why I think these uh, we should employ data minimization because the fewer records we keep, the less exposed a person is. For instance, in both um, on both sides of the spectrum, like Black Lives Matter had their records found, um, searched for, J6ers had their records searched for. Would a person below 18 or over 18 want to have their library records exposed to the police for any reason? I think that this isn't just an LGBTQ issue and their parents. I think this could have uh, long lasting um, issues that could affect someone. I think the freedom to read is paramount. And I really feel like that we should be protecting our patrons by having these records turned off. Current records, you can have access to because we need those to run a library. Those, according to NC law, we have to have the records that allow us to function. But historical records, I just feel like there's too much potential for misuse. Anybody who wants to know your reading habits, they're not trying to find out if you like Winnie the Pooh. So I just think keeping historical records, and I and this is the ALA's point of view, just isn't the best idea, the best choice for any age. Is there current guidance from the NC Community College System Office? I haven't heard anything since January. Are there any other questions? Um, I'll, I'll just say what I heard from the system, or what I've heard that the system office said was that it was up to the institutions. I don't know if that yes. rings true with you, Allison, or what, what you heard. That is um, what I heard as well. And people were trying to discuss how they should respond and I, I felt like there, I wanted to be the voice for keep, keeping our patron privacy private. <laughs> I'm from a public library in North Carolina. Our library's current policy states that adults 
are classified as 16 and older, meaning if a 16 year old comes into our library and wants a library card, if they have a photo ID, we allow them to sign up for a library card without a parent. Should we change our policy to 18? That's a great question. Um, I hadn't thought about that before. I, the, first of all, the, the new Patron Bill of Rights does not cover public libraries. So whatever you choose to do um, for uh, that age group is up to you currently and hopefully perpetually. But the law doesn't, I think that might, I would, I always want to protect our patron privacy. So do you have an opt-in system or are your children treated differently public library? I don't know if you're what um, ILS you're using or how you handle um, patron history. But I think right now public libraries should be able to um, make decisions for themselves at this point. 